Welcome to Section 7, PMAP. Back to our COVID example, we ended up here asking whether the factorization according to this graph imposes any conditional independence in addition to the local ones. And we saw that the answer was yes because of the global independences and the whole story with D separation. But the point was that P, the original distribution that factor rises according to this graph, it satisfies all of them. Now here's the new question. What about the other way around? That P distribution, does it include an independence that I cannot obtain by playing with the factorization? Okay, so basically I'm asking whether the two IG and IP are equal to each other. Recall Theorem soundness, we had that if a distribution P factorizes according to G, then IG is a subset equal to IP. So this implies that all independences implied by G are included in P. Now, I'm asking whether P can have an independence that is not included in G. I will give you the answer already. The answer is yes, you can have such a P. Let me frame the question differently, and that is, does it also hold that IP is a subset of IG? So the opposite of this, so that together I can conclude that they are equal to each other. Now, because I already gave you the answer here, of course, the answer here should be no. And it is no, but it's almost yes. Okay, so what's going on? In math, we can have almost yes. For those of you who may not be familiar with the notion of almost all, Here's the theorem, completeness. For almost all distributions P that factorize over G, IG will be equal to IP, except for a set of measure zero in the space of CPD parameterizations. Okay, what is measure zero? I will try to explain the idea with a few simple examples. Consider a plane. In a plane, we can have a triangle, for example, and a, or a circle or whatever, they have area, right? We can define an area of that shape. Now, what about a line, a line in the, that plane? That has an area of measure zero. That's how we say it. Or what about a plane, but this time in a 3D space? What is the volume of a plane? So it has a volume of measure zero. Okay, so it's almost zero. That roughly you can think of it like that. And there is a rigorous mathematical definition for it. If you're interested, you can look it up. Here it says that almost all P's, except for measure zero, now I hope you understand, like have an idea at least of the size of the number of P's that violate this rule, okay, that of this one. First, let's do a sketch of the proof. Assume that X and Y are not de-separated in G, but are independent according to the distribution P that factorizes according to G. So for simplicity, I'm assuming that Z is empty here. Now, the fact that X and Y are not de-separated, it means that X and Y are connected by some active trail U1 to Un such as here. Now I'm denoting the parents of ui in addition to ui plus one by the set si, okay? Now, the fact that x and y are independent according to p, it implies that p of x condition on y is equal to p of x. So if I take the difference, it should be zero, and I can write down p of x condition on y as the full joint distribution, but when, it's mar uh, when we're marginalizing out u1 to un, similar to the previous sketch of the proof we had in the previous slides. Okay, so then I, I can factorize the resulting joint distribution, which is uh, being marginal, that the u1 to un are marginalized out, I can factorize it according to this 
graph here. So it will be P of each node UI condition on its parent. And then SI, for simplicity here, I'm assuming that they don't have any parents. But that doesn't matter. I'm Even if they had additional parents, I'm just considering the, distrib the joint distribution of all these nodes here only. Okay, so I can write it down as P of each node UI condition on its parents, which are UI plus one and SI, and then multiply it by P of SI, and then minus P of X here, which I'm denoting X by U zero and Y by UN plus one. Okay, so we'll have the full thing. And what can I do from here? Well, each of these terms are summed over specific values of UI and SI. So for each specified value of UI and SI, say for example, UI is binary, then UI being true, UI plus one being false, and SI whatever, I will get a scalar for P. The resulting probability will be, for example, 0 0.1. I'm denoting each such term with the parameter theta. So here, theta UI, condition on UI plus one and SI, theta SI, theta U, zero okay so what i will end up with is a polynomial in terms of theta right so some of these these terms may be the same doesn't matter at the end i will have a multiplication of a number of these thetas added up with each other so what can i say about this polynomial this polynomial is not identically zero because there's a counter example there is an example p where these thetas are not zero. And this is exactly this proposition that we had here. If x and y are not disseparated in G, then x and y are dependent in at least one distribution P that factorizes over G. And there we said that we will later see that this sum is actually almost all, which is what we're exactly doing here. So I can conclude that the polynomial is not always zero. So when is it zero? Well, only at its roots. For example, x squared plus 2x plus 1 equal to zero. x is not always zero. The only case where the polynomial is zero is at its root, which is x equal to minus 1. Right? And the ratio of x equal to minus 1, this, the number that this happens, divided by the whole range of x, which is the full r real numbers, it's of a measure zero, right? Similarly here, this whole polynomial is not identically zero. It's only zero at its roots. And the number of the roots divided by the possibilities for theta, the real number, it's of measure zero, okay? Good. Let's see a number of examples. Consider the joint distribution x1 to x4, our typical example, and we assume that IP is x4 independent of x1 and x2, condition on x3, and its derivations, meaning that, for example, we can put x3 here or x4 condition on x, uh, x3 being independent on, of only x1, and so forth. I will not be writing that and its derivations after on here. Just I'm briefly referring to it here. Okay, so according to how P factorizes, one of the followings can hold. Either IG matches exactly IP, like in this example, we, will, we, we can see that the local independences here gives us this part, which is exactly as what appears in IP, and IG does not give us anything further. Okay, so in this case, they are equal, and that is what we call p-map. Graph G is a perfect map, or a p-map for P if IG equals to IP. Now, ideally, we want for a data set to look for a p-map, because then we're sure that we have captured all the independencies. But of course, that may not be all, always possible. Now, another case is, when IG is a subset of IP. So in this other example, that uh, we have a fully connected graph, we already know that the local independences are empty and the global ones are also empty. 
we don't have any independencies from the graph. So this is only an I map, not a P map. Another example is when IG actually includes an independence that is not covered in IP. So like here, the, this is also in IL, the local independencies. X2 being conditioned on X1 becomes independent of its non-descendants X3 and X4. This is in IL, but of course every IL is also in IG. So therefore this is not even an I map. No question about being a P map. Another example, the XOR example, that we have already addressed in the previous slides. Consider three binary variables X, Y, Z, such that their joint probability distribution follows this rule, that if, if X, XOR, Y, XOR, Z is a false, then the probability of the corresponding event is 1 over 12, and if it's true, then it's 1 over 6. We can have the corresponding table here, where the possibilities for each of the variables are listed here and the corresponding probability is listed here as well. Now if you check this table, you can see that the probability of the joint events x and y for whatever value they take, for example, x being true and y being true. This is always 1 over 4. For example, the x and y being true, you can see that it results in the last two rows here. And then you have to add up 1 over 12 and 1 over 6, which is 1 over 4. And then P of x, regardless of being true or false, you can check that this is also 1 over 2, and the same with P of y, so the two will be equal, resulting in x and y being independent. Okay? And similarly, you can show that X and Z and Y and Z are independent and they are included in IP. However, we can check that, for example, this conditional probability of X being true, Y being true, and Z being true, all of them being true, this is one conditioned, condition on Z being true, this is 1 over 6. On the other hand, it is not equal to P of X being true, condition on Z being true, and Y being, being true, condition on Z being true. Okay, you can check that this is 1 over 4 times 1 over 4. So, X is not independent of Y condition on Z. This is not in IP. So, this might have been surprising to you in the last time we saw this example without the rule and the table that how can X and Y be independent, but if we know Z, then they suddenly become not independent. But here's the explanation. Similarly, no other independence holds. Okay, there are not many possibilities. We can easily check them, and therefore IP will result in this set, X being independent of Y, and so on. Okay, like each pair of the variables are independent from each other, and nothing more. Of course, I'm, you may try to play around with it, like, I don't know, condition it on Y or anything else. I'm just ignoring all those trivial cases. Okay, now, let's try to build up a graph for it. Now, consider the V structure X, Z, Y here, imposing the local independence X being independent of Y, okay? So X condition is parent, which is empty, is independent of Y. We already have seen this. The V structure is an I map for P because this is included in IP. It is actually a minimal I map. We already saw that because if we remove this edge, then it will result in this additional in the conditional independence that was not included in IG. So it is a minimal I map. On the other hand, you can check that IG here equals ILG. D separation will not give you anything new in addition to ILG. So for example, X, we want to investigate whether it's D separated from Z. We know that if there is a link between them, they are not. So it's so small, it's easy to check. X being independent of Y is already included in ILG and so on. So IG in this case is not equal to IP. Okay, and therefore it is not a P map. Indeed, all minimal I maps for this XOR example are in the form of a single V structure 
and hence there is no G that can make a P map here. So it's, it's impossible to satisfy IG equal to IP. Okay. Now, interestingly, but I want to interpret the completeness, the, the almost all. So how can we, how come we can have such a structure, whereas we said there are just so few? Uh, the, the interpretation can be done in this way. If we have a distribution P that satisfies more independencies than IG, like in this XOR, XOR example, a slight perturbation of the CPDs of P will almost always eliminate these extra independencies. Back to our XOR example, if, we dis if the distribution changes slightly by E, so if we do a perturbation, and instead of the, the first rows, instead of having exactly 1 over 12 and 1 over 6, we have 1 over 12 plus a very small va value E and 1 over 6 minus a very small value E, which in practice will always happen. We will never have exactly 1 over 12 unless we really, I mean, when we're collecting data from any event, we have always noise, right? Unless we really meant to collect the exact correct output of an XOR. Okay, so we will see that then no longer X and Z are independent from each other because of the E. Like P of X and Z will be 1 over 4 plus E. You can check this out. And P of X times P of Z, when both of them are false, will be 1 over 2 times 1 over 2 plus E. Of course, the two are not equal to each other. And also, X and Z are not conditionally independent on Y. And you can also check the same. I have written the formulas here. X and Z condition on Y is this term. And then the separate multiplied by each other is this other term. So it can be shown that in this case, IP will reduce to simply X being independent of y. Okay, so the same graph becomes first of all an I map because all that this was imposing was exactly this and then IG was also only imposing this so then this will become a P map for P. Okay, so what happened we perturbed the system a little bit again that's most likely what we will see in practice the data is collected with noise, and then we see that it's a P. It becomes a P map. Now, this does not mean that the measure zero exceptions are accidental and never faced in practice. Well, let's see it in practice. Back to our COVID example with 12 variables, we saw that if we list the following conditional independencies, then we can accordingly construct the graph G, which is an I map for the joint distribution. We actually showed that it's a minimal I map. An exercise here is asking to show that this subgraph G1, which is taken from this part of the graph, is also a minimal I map for the variables corresponding to its nodes. You can try to prove it by looking at the factorization according to this graph G and marginalizing out the unnecessary variables. And to show that the remainder of the factorization is according to G1. And of course you can try to generalize this. You can ask yourself whether such an observation holds in general, meaning that for any subgraph G1 that you take from this graph G or any arbitrary graph directed acyclic graph G, it holds that if the graph G is minimally I map, then so is G1. For now, we just assume that G1 is a minimal I map for the joint distribution of MD, U, C, O, B. Some independencies may not be implied by the graph. Okay, so to make the analysis simple, we make two assumptions. First, COVID is limited to symptomatic cases, meaning that if infected, the person does cough. It's impossible for them not to cough. Second is that there is no reason for coughing other than COVID or flu. Okay, now, if the person does not cough, then it's impossible for them to have COVID based on the first assumption. So C is equal to zero. But what does this mean? This means that 
essentially COVID is observed and it's blocking the path from M to B. So M and B are independent in this situation. Now what if the person does call? Well, then based on flu, we have two situations. If the person does not have flu, then based on the second assumption, the person does have COVID, which again implies that COVID is observed and the path from M to B is inactive, implying that M and B are independent. If the person coughs and has flu, here we assume that the person cannot have COVID. If the person has COVID and flu at the same time, which is referred to as the so-called flu rona, then it's extremely rare for the situation to happen based on the reported cases that cur currently exist. For simplicity, we just assume that it is impossible. So again, C will be zero, making M and B independent. So what can we conclude from these three observations? Well, they imply that if I know O, coughing, and flu, then M and B will be independent. You may say, well, in the first case, I didn't observe flu. What if I observe it and then uh, this independence does not hold anymore? Well, it doesn't matter because once the person does not cough, then definitely C will be zero regardless of the value of flu. Okay? So still this will hold. But then look at this independence, conditional independence. This is not captured by D separation because M and B are linked to each other via this node COVID C. So this path is, this trail is active. I, I'm not conditioning it on C. So still they have become independent condition on some other variables, U and O. So I can conclude that the graph is, although minimal I map, it is not a P map for the corresponding distribution. So this is an example where we see that it's not ruined, it, the distribution is not ruined by some perturbation from the observed data. Like, it's not the XOR example. Okay, so it doesn't mean that our conclusion from XOR does not mean that we will never see in practice conditional independencies that are not captured by the graph. This was one example. Another example, consider the four variables COVID, flu, fever, and cough, where fever and cough can be considered as the symptoms and COVID and flu as the causes. Under some mild assumptions, it holds that the only independencies are symptoms are independent given the causes and vice versa. So that means that fever and cough as the symptoms are independent of each other given that COVID and flu are known. And vice versa, COVID and flu are independent given that we know the symptoms. Now, how can we construct a minimal IMAP for this joint distribution? Well, one candidate is G2 here, which is a minimal IMAP. We have the causes on the top, fever and cough, the symptoms in the bottom. And well, here we see that the first independence holds flu and cold, uh, fever and cough are independent once we know flu and COVID because the only way they are connected to each other is via these trails which will be blocked if we know these but then U and C flu and COVID will be marginally independent because they are connected to each other by V structures and when fever and cough are not observed then they are independent and this is not included here so it's not a perfect map. Another candidate is to have flu and COVID on the top and, and bottom, and then fever and cough, the symptoms in the middle. This time, the second independence holds. U is independent of C if we observe F and O, because both trails are blocked. But then F and O, these two, the symptoms are independent 
given you. So if I observe you, fever and cough will become independent. And this, they are independent only given use. Once I observe COVID in addition, then they will be linked via this trail, which becomes active because it's a V structure. So this first one will no longer hold. There is actually no graph structure that is a perfect map for this distribution. You can check that. So this is a second example where we cannot construct a P map for the distribution. Okay, back to our COVID problem. The question that we asked at the end was, does P include an independence not included in G? Meaning that is G a P map for P? Well, we cannot provide a firm no without listing all independences in IP. We need to know exactly what IP includes. One way that can help if we do that is to check if a non separated independence here appears in IP as well. Okay, to summarize, our goal was to get from this table of data on the variable C, M, and D to a factorization of the joint probability distribution. Last time, we found a couple of factorizations that were a minimal I map. And that implies that the P distribution here satisfies all independences imposed by these minimal I maps here. Now, the question then is, do the minimal I maps satisfy all independences imposed by P? Well, or equivalently, we can ask, are the minimal I maps a P map Depends on IP, of course. In this case, yes, because I have written all the conditional independencies for P. I assume that this is what we get from this table. And in this case, we see that both of these examples, they have all of the ones here. And of course, these are and the trivial cases, the derivations that I don't write. If we also write them, then we see that in this case, both of them, which are IG, exactly match IP. And so we can provide a firm answer, yes.